All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner, CRM. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Chris Besh, who is in Denver, Colorado. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing really good, John. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, and Chris is the CEO and founder of Choose People. Uh, and before that, you were the CEO of Exodus Moving and Storage. And it's there you achieved 40% less turnover than the in industry average in an industry, obviously, of huge, huge turnover. And then you parlayed that into a whole business around culture. But uh, you did a lot of research with um, in organization development with Colorado State University. So there's there's research and science behind what you do around workplace culture, too, right? Yes, it's it's um I've been lucky because I've had both that in the trenches experience and been able to create that turnaround um within my own company and then um and then again yes we did over a thousand hours of research with the industrial organizational psychology department at Colorado State University to find out what makes employees feel good about coming to work and how do you measure it and really looking at that emotional health piece. Yeah. And, and then, then and then you wrote the book, right? Culture works how to create yeah. happiness in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And and we've been doing this work now for eight years, and we've done it with organizations, everything from construction to retail to engineers to law firms. Um, so it really does run the gamut, and it's applicable to anyone who's really leading or managing a team. Excellent. So um, what, what I'm always interested in when the subject of culture in the workplace comes up, because it seems to be talked about a lot more nowadays. But for me, sometimes it sounds like, well, that's a bit of a buzzword and people like to talk about culture. But from your perspective, what does that really mean? What do we really mean by culture in the workplace? Right. So for me, when I'm describing culture, I'm really talking about the context within which your people are working. And so there's a couple different ways I talk about that. I, like culture literally is the air that your team is breathing mm -hmm. running your marathon, right? Or the other way to think about it, it's the energy force field, right? When they walk into their organization, you know, is their experience like Disney <laughs> or, you know, the DMV? Um, <laughs> right? So it can be a little bit soul sucking or does it actually create vibrancy and people are excited to be there and there's smiles and laughter and focus work and, you know, a, an experience of really winning and accomplishing and, and making magic happen. Um, and so it is that it is the, it's the environment. And one of the things that I always say is that, you know, as a, and we talk about, you know, how do you create happy employees? Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, but Chris, I'm not responsible for making people happy. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right because you can't actually make anyone happy. Right. However, if you're in leadership, you are responsible for creating an empowering context within which people can be happy. And oh, by the way, that will significantly boost your bottom line, like if they're coming from a joyful place rather than not. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I see that, um, you know, people sometimes fall into the trap, they go, okay, well, you know, in Silicon Valley, they give them foosball tables. So maybe if I put in a foosball table and and it looks all fun, um, then everybody's going to be happy. But that that's that's just uh, that doesn't work, right? Because I've seen many foosball table gathering dust after the first month. Right, and again, I think it's it can be a little bit heartbreaking, right? Because these organizations they really do have the best of intentions, mm -hmm. right? They really want to have this extraordinary workplace culture, but they're like. We don't know how to do it. And they think it's the foosball table. They think it's if they bring massages in. Mm -hmm. They think it's, and it's like, no, actually, and, and one of the things that, that we can talk a little bit more about, but, yeah. but everything that I do, all the work that I do, all the consulting that I do, the training that I do, the, like everything that's in culture works, how to create an extraordinary workplace culture really falls under three pillars. Mm -hmm. You have these three pillars, you can create that extraordinary workplace culture. And the, and, and the three, I'll just say what they are, and I'll explain a little bit yeah. more about each of them. But when you create a workplace environment in which people feel like they're known, that they matter, and that they're included, that's how you get there, right? So the known is that, like, you actually know me. Mm -hmm. you, like, you care about me as a person. You have a sense of who I am, what I'm about, you know, what's important to me, what's not important to me. Um, that I matter, that my contribution matters, that when I go above and beyond, it matters. And mm -hmm. oh, by the way, when I slack, like that also matters. Right. And then that sense of inclusion where, you know, there's a sense of belonging and kind of tribe and shared identity. And where like I'm, I'm, I'm within a community in which we have been brought together 
right, to fulfill on a shared purpose. Mm -hmm. And th those really are that known, matter, and included because a lot of organizations, they have a decent workplace environment, but they're, they're really missing like what it would take to get to extraordinary. And what it takes to get to extraordinary is emotional intimacy. Mm -hmm. That is how you get that, is having people feel known, matter, and included. And one of the things I always like to just kind of preface is let's say your workplace is just full on toxic. Right. It's just brutal, right? You can't actually start with emotional intimacy. Nice. You've actually got to go back, do some cleanup, address some things, right? So if I had come to my movers and mm -hmm. I've been like, guys, like, I'm going to have some emotional intimacy. Like, I was standing here before you, right? Like, they would have taken me out back outside. It would have been like, true. Yeah. So, you, would have, um, you would have disappeared in a storage van, yeah, never to be seen again. Yeah, because when I came into the moving company, just so for clarity's sake, I mean, it was brutally toxic. People mm. were yelling obscenities at each other and not, not like, yo, yo, we're tight. But like, yeah. I'm going to take you out back where the sun doesn't shine. Yeah. It's not going to be good. You know, so that that was kind of the, that was, and we were struggling to cover payroll, mm. right? Because it impacts your financials. It absolutely, your people are the ones who are taking care of your clients. And so it's one of those, if they don't feel good about coming to work, the way they're going to show up to your clientele, like there's just, it doesn't, it's not going to mm -hmm. work or they're creating your product or your service and right, whatever it is that your organization does. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's really like the, the three pillars Brian and I is having to go from good to extraordinary is to have your people feel known, matter and included. And if you're like, gosh, Chris, we're not even a good, we're mm -hmm. not even that, like, decent, then, then you've got some cleanup to do, right? right? Like you've got some toxicity that needs to be spoken to addressed. And there's, you know, there's ways to accomplish that too. But what I found is about 70% of organizations are those organizations where it's like, okay, like no one's going to go postal. Mm -hmm. So five, <laughs> no one's go postal. Um, at the same token, like people aren't clamoring to work here. Right. Right. And, 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 and it would be a stretch to say that our people are really happy and mm -hmm. that it's extraordinary. And so that's, that's really where that emotional intimacy opportunity comes in. So here's an interesting uh, challenge um, for how things have developed nowadays. So we're getting much more into distributed and remote workforces, right? Where we're not, uh, you know, we don't have big headquarters anymore. People aren't all coming into work in the same place. And obviously right. when you're in a physical space together, it's probably easier to do some of these things. So how do you achieve this for the companies that are distributed where remote workers, how, how do you make sure that you're known, that people are known, mattered, included, and you develop some emotional and intimacy when you're really doing it completely virtually? Right. So um, it's interesting, John, right? So I actually made the same assumption that you did mm -hmm. in that it would be a lot easier, right, to have an extraordinary workplace culture when there is that physicality. Mm -hmm. And what I can tell you is that of all the organizations I worked with over the past eight years, the highest scoring company on our workplace culture audit is a completely remote team. Oh, wow. Right. And I was, I was shocked. I was like, really? Like, wow. Like, and you know, and, um, and actually learned a lot from that company. I was able to contribute a lot too, which is mm -hmm. good, but it was one of those where I learned a lot from them. And, um, one of the things I would say is that, yeah, you might have to make a little bit more of an effort, right. To, you're not going to meet someone at the water cooler. You're not mm -hmm. going to by their desk, but there's, you know, whether you're using different technologies like Slack or right. honestly, simply picking up the phone mm -hmm. you'd be amazed how rare just like phone calls occur anymore and like when someone actually calls you and is like hey i just want to check in on you see what's happening like what's working for your day anything <laughs> you're struggling with anything i can help you out with right but there's all sorts of um i actually have a whole and if anyone in your audience wants this if they want to reach out i actually have a list of like specifically for if you are remote here are some real tangible ways to, to create that, you know, that environment of camaraderie mm -hmm. because it can be that sense of like, Oh, people get siloed, but ironically you can be in a building yeah. and there can be crazy silos. So it, yeah. it really is intentionality and um, where people are, are given where it's made a priority in the organization to have people genuinely get to know one another and to mm -hmm. acknowledge when people are performing really well, also acknowledge when they're struggling and look to support and guide and coach them, right? And then, mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah. So. Yeah, and and I think it's funny because I mean we we're we're quite a, a distributed remote organization ourselves, and and I found over time that. Um, to your point uh, exactly is that out of necessity you communicate a lot more um, and you know you we use slack and, and all the sorts of tools like that and you do end up you do end up sort of getting to know people more because you're communicating a lot more um, as I said almost out of necessity and if I think back to when I ran organizations that were in a building it's very easy for someone to shut their door stick on their headphones and sort of go don't come near me, right? So you can actually have you can actually have the people who are in the building more remote than the people who are remote. <laughs> really good point, John. Yeah, I think there's a lot. I mean, at the end of the day, if people don't want to be in community, mm -hmm. they won't be, yeah. whether they're remote or whether they're on site. And there's an opportunity in your hiring. One of the things that um, this company that scored the highest, they're called Spatial Key, is they would actually evaluate in their hiring process for conversational aptitude, mm. which is really interesting, right? Yeah, and yeah, yeah for sure. Aptitude. And right? what, sorry? Uh, listening. Their mm. capacity to like listen and really be able, and I know that sounds silly, but like if, it's always hilarious to me, right? Like communication, we always think it's all about what we say and how we communicate and what we say, but the other half of communication is being able to listen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And, so, and in yeah. fact, in fact, and not just being able to listen, but actually be able to actively listen, because, you know, a lot of people will will listen, but really they're formulating what they're about to say next and not really literally half listening to what you're saying as opposed to actively listening. But so I wanted to come back to, OK, can you talk a little bit more about this idea of emotional intimacy? Because there's maybe some people out there. Um, who are going, eh, it all sounds a little bit, eh, sounds a little bit fluffy and all of that for my liking. Uh, yeah. So can, so can you explain that a little more um, and explain why um, that is so critical to, to a, a winning culture? Yeah, absolutely. So the, there's two pieces I'll speak to. One is that um, I always, whenever I'm speaking to an audience, right? So I speak at conferences mm -hmm. around the country and, um, invariably I say to them, like, listen, if you go back to your HR person and you tell them you want to increase emotional intimacy, <laughs> like I'm gonna slap you upside the head and be like, Did you not just see the movement that's going across <laughs> this country? Um, and so I say, then you can say, you know, you're really looking to increase camaraderie. Right. Because that's that's kind of a similar way to think about it. But there is um, right, this this happiness piece that I talk about, again. There will be folks who are like, why does that matter? Why, like, like, can't we just get the work done, go home, get our paychecks, call it a day, you know, and just and be done with it. And and the thing that I always like to point to is there's a huge, huge return on investment of happy employees. Mm -hmm. Right? So if you have an employee that's making, let's say on average they're making forty thousand dollars a year, right? And so, and again, I realize you've got people making eighty thousand, double it, right? Like however it works sure. for you. But if you have an employee that's making $40,000 a year, and if that employee is unhappy, mm -hmm. like they're unhappy, at minimum, it will cost you an additional $39,000 a year. Wow. If that same employee is happy, they'll contribute an additional $21,000 a year. So it's a spread of $60,000 or 1.5 multiple of their salary. So exp and explain how they an unhappy, because I think this is a critical yeah. point. Explain how an unhappy person is costing you so much money. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, let me just like, oh, my goodness. Like, how, <laughs> how, right. So obviously how they show up to your clients mm -hmm. right? energetically, how willing, how kind, how supportive, how generous. Um so there's a cost in customer satisfaction, there's a cost in absenteeism, there's a cost in turnover, mm -hmm. there's a cost in the energy drain on the other employees on your team and the time and energy that's spent around either their drama, their negative attitude, their disgruntlement, whatever that looks like. Um, I'm trying to, we actually have a document that the numbers that I just threw out, it shows the whole calculation mm -hmm. and all of the research that backs up those numbers. Um, but those are the biggies. Those are the like, and you have to, I mean, we all know that there's a huge energy drain when you are working with someone who doesn't want to be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. No, it is. And, and obviously we always see that when it's so, it so often happens when that person leaves, right? the, the energy leveling goes up. 
right? So across the board. No, I mean, it is. Yeah. And, you know, I always think that it's, uh, and I always believe that if someone is unhappy and doesn't like being there, um, that it's your, it's almost your duty to help them go find something that'll make, if you can't make them happy in your place, it's go help them go find somewhere else to be happy rather than just sort of tolerate them. But um, one of the like, things, it's one of the things, I'm sorry, go on. One other piece I think yes. is really important because um, I did speak to the financial return on investment, mm -hmm. but I also want to speak to the emotional return on investment. Right. And I'll just, I'll just say it really briefly, but when people feel good about coming to work, they go home and they show up as better parents, mm -hmm. better spouses, better citizens, right? Like there's a ripple effect in our communities and just to like get the world of it, I'll never forget. There was a woman I sat down with her, shared with her, she, you know, heads up a company, shared with her our culture audit process and, um, and said how we literally measured, do your employees feel good, emotional health? Do they mm -hmm. feel good about coming to work? And her eyes got really big and her, you know, her mouth dropped open. And I was like, what, like, what's <laughs> like, what? And she says, she said, Chris, I kid you not. At my last company, there were days I would be driving to work and I'd rather get in an accident oh. than arrive to work. And like, it's just, I mean, it's heartbreaking mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be that way. And so I, the re financial return on investment, it's a no brainer. It's an absolute no brainer because creating extraordinary culture is not about throwing money at people, mm -hmm. not this huge financial investment. It's, it's a time investment, which time is money. Like I get that but it comes back tenfold. But then there's also just the emotional return on investment. Like what are we creating in our society? Yeah. No, no, I think that's a, I think that's a very, that's a great point. But how do you also then deal with the fact is, okay, so as even if we love our jobs, we're not happy all the time and we don't love it all the time. Cause that's, you know, right. that's, that's, that's not possible. So how do you, how do you create or differentiate between overall happiness and, you know, the fact is that work is work and there are going to be times when, you know, we just, all you know, jump. That, right? <laughs> like we all, yeah, 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 totally got that. Well, and the difference really is, right, there's momentary challenges, right? And there's circumstantial situations in which it's like, dog on it, like we just cannot seem to like get this project right. Like we're really mm. working hard on it. But again, even if there's a challenge within the organization, if you feel like you're known, matter, and included, and I ask you about how's work going, you might say to me, gosh, we have this project we're really trying to figure out, but you're not going to say to me, man, I, I really wish I could find another job, mm -hmm. right? And it's that like challenges are fine, hard days are fine, you know, it's not like it's going to be rainbows and butterflies. It's just like, that's not realistic. But when it's day after day an experience where it's like soul sucking or, you know, you're having to work with someone who's verbally abusive or you're working with, you know, where there's just not a lot of appreciation and acknowledgement, like things like that, it wears mm -hmm. on you. Right. That, and one of the things I always say to people real simply, you can literally go to your team and do a litmus test. Mm hmm Hey, on a scale of one to 10, how happy or unhappy are you about coming to work here? And if all of your people say seven, which is a really common response, mm -hmm. um, you're, you're, you're in the mech, like you're average, right. <laughs> like, like we're doing okay. Like again, no postal high five, <laughs> like, but, but, but you got people less than that. And you have an opportunity mm -hmm. to ask them like, Hey, what would make that a plus one, mm -hmm. right? Whatever number they give you what would make that a plus one? What would make the difference? And not, not what would make an 11 or 12. No, mm -hmm. like I'm not, we want to stay in the world of reality and grounded. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, I think we all, I think people are pretty clear when it's situational or temporary right. as compared to like, yeah, soul sucking mm. is probably the best way. <laughs> <laughs> so as we're coming to the end, what what is if if you were to say anybody listening to this from an organization, if there's one thing that they could start doing today, what would that be, or should that be? Mm. So it depends, mm -hmm. and and I'll make it brief since we are at the end. So if you are a company that you know you're less than seven, right. No, you're less than seven. Then you need to you have you have to address whatever happened in the past, whether it's events, 
you, and you have to own, especially if you're in leadership, right? You have to own that you allowed it to get there. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And until you kind of create that clean foundation to work off of, that's the work to be done. Right. Now, if you're, if you're that seven company, right, then that is really looking at how do we create where people are no matter and included. And I will shamelessly plug my book because yeah, it's got all the tools and all the information and mindset shifts to help you create that. And it's a book and a workbook for those who are leading and managing teams. Yeah. And actually, I was going to, I was going to, the next piece, I was going to get you to talk about the work you do and how people can learn more about you. Yeah. And then I do want to say, let's say you're an eight, nine or 10. Mm-hmm. What if you're like, we got a rocking culture. Then like you actually want to capture your secret sauce. So you go to your team and say, what are all the ingredients that make it that we have such an extraordinary workplace culture? Mm. So that way if things get wonky or go sideways. You can literally go back to that list and be like, what are we missing? What are we forgetting? Like, you know, what, how did it shift? Because a lot of times that happens where people are like, we used to have the magic. And yeah. Now like, Rrr. So yeah, that's just the other thing I want to acknowledge because there are companies out there that that are rocking the Casbah. Yeah, so. and I love that uh, what you told us earlier about the um, is it spatial key about that that remote, totally remote company. You've got that fantastic culture because I do think that a lot of people are moving into much more distributed remote organizations. And it's key that they understand that they can actually create and probably sometimes an even better culture and that culture isn't, confined to physical buildings right absolutely not at all Mm -hmm. not at all at all yeah Yeah. so uh, as we finish up uh, chris love you to tell people a little bit more about yourself how they can find out more about you what you do and how they can contact you yeah thanks john just um real simply our website is choosepeople.com and then um, we have a weekly culture tip that you can sign up for if you want to get a free weekly culture tip which always includes some kind of tool or action item and then, um, yeah, the other thing I would just recommend is our book, which is called Culture Works, How to Create Happiness in the Workplace. And you can get it on Amazon or um, off of our website. And there is a book and a workbook, and you can just buy one or the other or buy it as a set, just depending on your preference. Yeah. Um, listen, Chris, this has been absolutely fascinating. I hope you'll come back and talk more about it, because I think we could go into a number of different areas here. So I'd love to have you back to talk more. Um Thank you. Yeah, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. Thanks again, Chris, and I'll see you all again for another expert interview really soon.